picture of the person next with you and then put it on Facebook and say, this is where you should be at. Amen. In the house of the Lord, right? Before y'all start saying, well, in the north gate. Well, in the house of the Lord. Let's make that general. Hey, man, y'all look so good. Hey, Amen. Just look at someone and say, you look so good. And the person you ignore, tell them, you look good too. <laughs> God is good. Come on, can we see some teeth? God is good. If you believe that, give him a round of applause, right? Um, you know, we've been on a, uh, and, and I promise today is the last day for uh, uh, Living Surrender series, amen? But I couldn't help myself. Uh, I had did a lot of study on, on offense. And, um, man, how many know, again, you know, we live in a world where people are always offended, right? Uh do you know that the more I got into this word, I noticed how many times I got offended in one day. I noticed that I was getting offended for some silly stuff. And, and I was like, oh, my God, the more I'm getting into this word about offense, I'm noticing that I, I, I get offended a lot. Uh-oh. Pastor, you are a pastor. How can you say that? Because I'm human, bless the Lord. But that's okay because guess what? The more I started to look at this, the more I started to discipline myself in or certain areas. Amen? And so what I'm calling this today is exchanging my offenses. Amen? Tell your neighbor, there's got to be an exchange. Go with me because I, I, got, I got 30 minutes and I want to really dive into this. Go with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 18. Verses 19, verse 19, bless the Lord. Proverbs 18, 19. And when you have it, just say amen. It is harder to win back the friendship of an offended brother than to capture a fortified city. His anger shuts you out like iron bars. Now, I want to make this relatable to us all because we don't live in a city that has walls. But I want to ask you something. What makes a city fortified back in those days, right? Walls. Everyone say walls. You know, uh, so what he's saying is this. It's easier to win a city that has walls doesn't matter how thick or how high. It's easier to win a city than to win a brother that is offended with you. Amen? So what makes a fortified city? Walls. And why are walls, uh, what, what were they meant for? They were meant for protection. So whenever a king uh, uh, decided to create a wall around his kingdom, he made sure that the walls that he used were really thick and really high for the safety of those that were inside. He used these walls because he wanted to make sure that those that he thought were his enemies would be kept out. And at the same time, he wanted to make sure that those that he knew that weren't his enemies were kept safe on the inside. And I like to share this with you that offended people do the same thing. They build walls. And you know why they build walls? Because they're protecting their hearts, they're protecting their emotions. And you know what they do with walls? They try to keep out the people that they believe are their enemies. And they only try to keep the wall uh, uh, with those that they love and that are dear to them. They keep them inside the walls, right? On the, on the safe end of the walls, I should say. But here's the issue with that type of mindset. Number one, when people begin to build walls, what they're actually doing, they're separating themselves from people. Tell your neighbor. Are you offended? 
I haven't seen you in my house. Amen. Bless the Lord. But here's the issue with that kind of mindset with those that get offended. Go with me to the book of John chapter 13, verse 34. You know when you're offended because you keep these people away from your house. You keep them away from your, your family. You, you put boundaries, amen? You don't want them on this side, amen, because they hurt you. So you're trying to do everything in your power to protect yourself. But here's the problem with this mindset. John 13, 34 and 35. I give you a new law. You are to love each other. You must love each other as I loved you. If you love each other, all men will know that you are my followers. Did you see the issue with putting walls up when you're offended? Building walls towards people, that is. Can I tell you this? Jesus, it says, love people the way I love you. In other words, Jesus says, I knew all your junk and I still loved you. I knew that everything you did was against me, but yet I loved you. In fact, the Bible says that uh, God showed his greatest love by sending Jesus, his son, to die for you and for me. How many know that you can't build a wall when someone wants to show you how much he loves you? And the problem is that when we're offended, we can't show nobody how much we love them. Someone say, uh-oh. Jesus loved and did not build a wall to keep us out. In fact, he used a cross to build the gap. Say amen to that. In fact, we can look at it in the Old Testament. The Bible says, or in the New Testament, that when Jesus rose up from the dead, guess what was uh, uh, ripped or torn in half? The veil. What does that mean? It meant that there was nothing there to keep you from coming. And God says, I want you to love people in that same way. Oh, I'm not going to get a lot of help on this one because people are like, you just don't know, Pastor. But we're reading the Bible. How many children of God are in this house? Amen? Because that's why we're putting pictures. I had you take pictures of yourself. So we could put it on Facebook in case you're lying. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Amen? Jesus loved us and he did not put a wall. In fact, he used a cross to fill a gap. Amen? The world will see that we are the followers of Jesus, church, by the way we love each other. Amen? And allow me to say this. By your offenses, the world doesn't see Jesus. When you are offended, people don't see Jesus. When you are offended, they do not see Jesus. And neither can Jesus use you because you're not using a cross to bridge people over. You're building walls to keep them away. And Jesus says this, I have a problem with you. I didn't offend, I didn't get offended with you. I, in fact, I came in obedience and I died for you. I had every right to not come, but I did because of what my father wanted. By offenses, the world doesn't see Jesus. If anything, they see separation. Now, I want to share this with y'all, church. The love that the church exhibits, according to the book of John 13, 35, guess what kind of love that is, church? That's agape love. Amen? It's the love that covers a multitude of sin. That's why you can't love people with your own love, because you can't cover their sins. You get offended with their sins. But if I allow God to love the people through me, naturally those sins are covered. Oh, come on now. Amen? If I learn to love people with his love, guess what? It's 
perfect love. Can I tell you this? There is no fear in perfect love. And many of us are fearful to love them because we're afraid to be hurt. But when you love people with God's love, it's perfect love has no fear. Say amen to that. I know I'm talking to some marriages right now that you're afraid to love your wife with all of your heart because you're afraid she won't respect you the way she should. But there's no fear in perfect love. So when you love with God's love, guess what? You're not wondering if they're going to do anything bad. Why? Because you're not loving with your love. You're loving them with God's love. Amen? When we love like the way the, uh, uh, God is calling us to see, the world gets to see Jesus. I want you to hear that, church. When you love the way God calls you to love, the people, the world, see Jesus. Isn't that why we exist? When you love the way God calls you to love, guess what? You allow your spouse that says, I don't want nothing to do with Jesus, to be compelled to want to know Jesus. I'm going to tell you a quick testimony. There was a, name, a man by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. And um, he used to be a drunk. This is in the early 1800s. And um, he didn't know how to write. He was a plumber. And his wife was a woman of God. What was she? A woman of God. And one day, she says to her husband, listen, honey, uh, uh, there is a, a, a conference going on, and, and, and I want to go to it. And, of course, Smith Wigglesworth says, uh, and he was, by, by, uh, I want you to know, this man was a mighty man of God. But during that time, he was not a Christian. He was not a believer. And his wife was. And his wife says to her husband, listen, there's food on the stove. Everything you want is already cooked. All you got to do is serve yourself. But I'm going to this conference. And he stood up. And he was a drunk. And he stood up and he says to his wife, if you go, I'm going to lock you out of this house. Don't you dare come back to this house. And he was drunk. And she says, you know what, honey, whatever you want, whatever you say, okay, sure, whatever. But I'm going to this conference Hasta la vista. I'm out. And she left. She went to the conference. And uh, the story goes on to say this, that he woke up in the morning. The man woke up in the morning and he went to feel the side of where his wife usually sleeps. But guess to his surprise, she wasn't there. He says, oh, oh my God, my wife. I locked her outside the house. Oh, my God, what happened to my wife? And guess what happens? He gets dressed up, and he's about to go look for his wife. He opens the door, and guess who's rolled up in the ball at the door? His wife. And you know what this woman does? She gets up from the ground. She says, honey, I'll be right back. Let me just go brush my teeth, and I'll go cook you some breakfast. I'm going to say that again. I said she slipped on the ground and, and, and she had every right. Someone say, sometimes you got a right to be mad. But if you're going to be serving God, you don't have that right no more. I'm going to say that again. You have a right to be upset. But once you give your heart to Jesus, you don't have the right to be upset, offended. Oh, I know I'm talking to somebody. <laughs> this woman got up and she says to her husband, I'm going to brush my teeth and I'm going to come back and make you some breakfast. You know what that man did? He collapsed on the floor. And he says, what is it with you, woman, that, that you can't just be mad at me? She says, honey, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And I'm not going to be offended because that stops him from fighting my battles. I love you, and I'm going to here to serve you, and vice versa. That man collapsed, and he gave his heart to Jesus because she did not get offended because she chose to let him see Jesus instead of seeing her separation. 
I know it's hard for you women to do something like that. I'm not saying it is, that, that it's easy. But I'm telling you this. you got to learn how to conquer small offenses so when the big ones come, it won't be a big deal. Oh, come on and give God some praise if I'm talking to you. So when we love each other in the manner that God is calling us to, guess what? We, we show our children that ain't serving God yet to see Jesus. Amen. The ones that don't want to change the neighborhood that people say, now nothing good can come out of East Chicago or Hammond. Guess what? If you love like Jesus, people are seeing Jesus. If you love like Jesus, somebody is being impacted. Somebody is being transformed. Somebody is getting hope. Somebody is getting saved. Because you refuse to allow your offense to separate you from those that need to be saved. When you love like Jesus, the people in the world see Jesus as hope. They see Jesus as love. They see Jesus as the light. They see Jesus as the way maker. They see him as grace. They see him as healer. They see him as a way maker. They see him as restorer. They see him. They see him as the Lord of the breakthrough. Why? Because somebody has refused to be used by the enemy and say, God, here I am. Use me if you can use anybody. I can get offended, but I refuse to be offended. Tell your neighbor, don't build a fence. Satan doesn't want the world to see Jesus. And offense is a perfect weapon against the church. I'm going to say it again, amen. Satan does not want Jesus. He don't care about you. He don't want Jesus to be seen. Because if Jesus is not seen, then people will see you, and you can't do nothing. You can't save nobody. You can't heal nobody. You can't do nothing. So if I can get you offended, they won't see you. You want your husband to change? Refuse to be offended. You want your wife to know Jesus? Refuse to be offended. You want your children to, to come to know Jesus? Stop complaining and stop being offended about the little things and pushing your children closer to hell. Hmm. Satan doesn't want Jesus to be seen. When Satan says, I don't want Jesus to be seen, what he's really saying, I don't want the world to see light. I want them to remain ignorant in darkness. I want them to know there is no hope for them. I want the church to be divided. Well, you're not vaccinated. You are. You ain't got a mask. You do. I ain't sitting with you since you don't love me. I ain't going to church because nobody's safe over there, but you at Walmart. I ain't going to church, but you at every function out there. Ain't afraid to get in an elevator with 10 people and ain't got no mask. Talking about I ain't going to church. I'll press the button. You're touching everything. Uh-oh. Satan don't want you to represent Jesus. How best way to do it? Get you offended. And let me just tell you this. We ain't going there, but let me just throw that at you. If you're offended, it's an open door for hatred, which is the opposite of love. Hatred is this, church. Is to be absolute, vacuumed out of love. That's why the Bible says, how can you say you love me, but you hate your brother that you can see? There's no way you can love me that you can't see, but hate the one that you see. That's, you're a liar. The Bible says the world needs to see Jesus, but it comes through the avenues of your love for one another. Our enemy 
to look at someone and say, you ain't my enemy. Amen? The ones that can bleed and the ones you can see are not your enemy. Amen? Satan is always trying to divide the church. And we have to learn to respond to the potentials that have the ability to offend us. Go with me to the book of Luke chapter 17, verse 1. We got to get better on how we need to respond to this. Amen? Luke 17, 1. One day Jesus is teaching his disciples, and this is what he says. Betrayals, offenses are inevitable. But great devastation will come to the one guilty of betraying or offending others. That word offense in the Greek means this, church, a trap but with a bait. That word offense, church, means this, a trap with a bait. I'd like to share this with you all. Whenever you're trying to catch an animal, you know what we do? We hide the trap, but we reveal the bait. I'm going to say this again. When we want to catch a, a raccoon, a possum, or, or whatever, a mouse, whatever, the trap is hidden. It's invisible to the eye of the one we're trying to catch. And the only thing we reveal to the thing that we want to catch is the bait. Can I tell you this? Satan hides the trap, but he shows you the bait. When he wants you to get offended, he never shows you the trap. He never shows you the trap. He never shows you the trap, but he will show you the bait. The bait is the offense. What they said, what they didn't do, what they did, what they lied about. Well, so, so what's the trap? I never knew it was going to cause a divorce. I never knew it was going to sever a relationship that I knew for so many years. I would have responded better had I known what was hidden. I would have did something better. I would have, I, I would have did something. I would have taken time to pray and fast so that I would have responded in the right way. But I had a bad attitude when I did it. Now, now I'm stuck. Oh, my, 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 my. The bait is offense. And for those that are writing notes, I want to share this with you. If you feast on it, if you nurture your offense, if you entertain it, and you water that offense, what do you think is going to happen? What do you expect when you water something? The offense grows. And when it starts to grow, it begins to torture you. I'm going to say it again. It tortures you. It plays on your mind. You can't sleep right. You can't minister right. You can't even sing like you know you can sing because you're too caught up in what happened instead of what God can do something. Someone says you're trapped. Proverbs 19 verse 11. Proverbs 19, 11. Come on. The bait is obvious, but you don't need to grab it. And I got good news. If you did grab it, and if you did catch it, and if you did water it, entertain it, guess what? Let go of it now. Amen? Amen. Come on. That's right. Amen. Proverbs 19, 11. Let's read this. Coming from the Passion Translation. An understanding person demonstrates patience. For mercy means holding your tongue. When you are insulted, here it is, be quick to forgive and to forget. For you are virtuous when you overlook an offense. You are what? 
So you mean to tell me you ain't weak? Uh oh, come on, I like that. So if I overlook an offense according to scripture, am I stupid? Then why is it that we struggle to overlook something because we're afraid to be looked at as weak? To overlook an offense and all of a sudden to say, well, I'm not going to be stupid. I'm going to handle mine. Hmm. The Bible says you are virtuous. You are virtuous. You are victorious. You are great. You are strong when you can overlook an offense. You know, I'm going to share something with y'all. Um, Tuesday. Now, mind you, last Sunday we preached about offense, right? Tuesday comes up. I get a letter in the mailbox. And uh, there's some news that, uh, uh, some daunting news that, that I did not want to see. And can you believe it for that split second? This is why folks that say, I, I want to be a preacher, be, a, be careful. Because, man, whatever you preach up here, it's going to come back. Your kids are going to preach it to you. Your wife is going to preach it to you. And, and, and those that watch you on Facebook are going to preach it back to you. So I told my wife, I can't believe this company. Man, they, they're, there's no integrity in their service. Man, I pray that God shut that company down for their, their, their way of business. Man, send fire over there, God. <laughs> Pastor Joe, and you know what my wife said? She said, babe, how can you get offended? And you've been preaching this. Man, I that I, and you know what? So quick, I wanted to be offended with her because she told me the truth. <laughs> what are you telling me? What? That flesh got up so quick. And I stood there looking. I said, you're right, babe. I'm not going to give in to this. I grabbed that paper, threw it away. I said, honey, I am so sorry. What was I thinking? God, forgive me. I, as soon as I got it, I let go of it. Come on, amen. If you ain't going to water it, you're going to starve it to death. And don't we want to starve a fence? I want Jesus to be seen. So that means I got to shut up so he can open up his mouth. Tell your neighbor, I love you too much to be offended with you. There's too many people that need to see Jesus. And I can't allow this hiccup to mess me up. Tell your other neighbor, you mean too much to me. Man, when I read that verse, I was kind of upset, Oli. I ain't even going to lie. I was looking for verses and verses, and this one came up, and I said, oh, this sounds good. I started reading, and all of a sudden it says, when you are insulted, be quick to forgive and forget. I said, man, I can forget, but I don't know if I can forget. And I said, nope, it says forget. there and I was like, good Lord, I got to preach this. I said, man, God, you, and you know, he got to deal with me first, right? So, man, I have been just literally just looking and say, God, thank you that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not offended. I'm good. I'm good. Remember what I said before, if we don't learn to uh, master offense, it will master you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. If you don't learn to master it, you will be its puppet. So no strings on me. Amen. Something that I thought I'd, I'd throw at you guys. Can I tell you that Satan uses strangers not so much to hurt you, but to make you mad. But he uses those that are close to you to offend you. I'm going to say that again. Strangers can say whatever, and you can just, eh, whatever. You don't know me, no how. Eh, shut up. <laughs> you get up in your car and you move. But Satan knows if I want to really hurt you, if I really want to cut you deep, I'm going to use that person that you esteem the most. Because it cuts different. Oh, y'all don't want to talk. Y'all act like y'all have never been offended. 
Okay. <laughs> now, you can be mad at the, the, a stranger can make you mad and tell your neighbor, oh, it's okay to be mad. The Bible even tells you, it's okay to be angry. It gives you the license to be angry. I want to put it to you like this because sometimes we say, well, you can't be angry. No, no, you can be angry. You have the right to do that. You have the license to be angry. Jesus, we've seen him angry, and he would whip and peel folk. Whoops, whoops. You know, flipping tables and everything. But that was a righteous anger. I'm going to be spanking my kids. That's a righteous anger. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding, my kids are all grown. <laughs> I just said that in case y'all thought about that. No. <laughs> so the Bible gives us a license to be angry, but listen to this. Not the right to be led by your anger to the point of sinning. Amen? By sinning, I am referring to respond to matters opposite in the way of Jesus. Amen? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20, yeah, Ephesians 4, 26. I know I'm giving you a lot of verses, but I want y'all to use them, amen? Look over them. Ephesians 4, 26. Don't let the passion of your emotions lead you to sin. Don't let the passion of your emotions to lead you to do something that is against the will of God. Don't let anger control you. You could, in fact, control anger. Don't allow anger to fuel your uh, uh, fuel you for revenge. I want to tell those people that came to church and you might have got upset waiting for the praise team to usher you in to make it easy. Guess what? Get over your anger before the day's over because you can't trust yourself without watering it. The longer you hold on to it, the faster you will start to cater to it. Hold on to it long enough and you'll start watering it. You'll start catering to it. Man, I know Cynthia said that to me and I knew she was within her heart. I know it. I can just look at Sister Jeanette's eye and I knew she had it out for me. I just knew it. Because she didn't even say hi. She didn't even bake me no cake, no nothing. Come on. Sister Julia don't even like working out with me. I'm offended. Rawr. Come on. You can be angry, but you need to learn to be disciplined in the moment that you are angry. Amen. I know you want to say something mean to hurt those that offended you, but don't let anger control you. Amen? I know habits are hard to break. You need to break something to prove something. I came to remind you, you're no longer a loose cannon. You're a new creation. You belong to God. You're an imitator of Jesus Christ. You can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. You have a disciplined mind. You got love and you got self-discipline. Someone said, I can do all things through Christ. One of the biggest ways we're sucked into offense, church, is uh, when we're still led by our former way of living. Ephesians 4, 22 through 25. Ephesians 4, 22 through 25. Throw off your sinful nature and your former way of living, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, you do this. Let the Spirit of God renew your thoughts and your attitude. Put on your new nature. Put on your new nature. Put on your new nature. Who am I talking to? Put on your new nature that is created to be just like God, who is righteous and holy. What are you saying? Throw off your old nature, your former way of living. Allow me to say it in simple terms. Stop practicing your old ways. Amen? Stop practicing your old ways. You have a new nature. 
If gossip is your former way of living, stop talking about people. You are a new creation. If holding a grudge is part of who you used to be, because that's the only way you knew, it, knew how to deal with folk, let go of it. That's not who you are anymore. Stop. He says, and let the spirit, I like to say, give the spirit, the spirit of God, permission to renew your mind and your attitude. Let him change your thinking and he'll change your living. Amen? Because he leads to all truth and tr the truth that we know is what sets us free. Amen? So, someone said, I need some truth. Amen? Put on the new nature created to be like God. In other words, church, practice living in your new nature. I want to say this. Exchange your offense for his ability to forgive. I I'm going to finish this, church. When people love, when, no, when people we love and give our hearts to hurt us, it cuts differently. Say amen. Because we never expect that from the people we love. We don't expect people that we love to betray us. We don't expect them to hurt us. We don't expect to be the topic of their gossip. We don't ex expect to be backstabbed by those that we have given our hearts to. Here's the problem, though, church. The greater the expectation of a person, the greater the offense of when they don't meet your expectation. I'm going to say that again. It's important to hear this, church. The greater the expectation that I have for a person, the greater the offense because of them not meeting my expectation. And I asked myself, because I would think you would ask the same the common question. But you don't know what they did. How many know that? I mean, we say that a lot when we want to hold on to our offense. Allow me to tell you this when you say that. You forgot what Jesus has done for you. You don't know what they did to me, Pastor. No, you're telling me. You forgot what Jesus did for you. You're only here because he forgave you. You're here because he overlooked what the world would have magnified. Acts 24, verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a clean conscience, void to offense towards God and towards man. i like to share this with you all. There are offenses that we don't like, and then there are offenses that cut us really deep that almost makes it impossible to overcome. Anyone has ever been offended in that manner? It's difficult to overcome. But I want to share this with you. If wounds are not properly treated, they are never healed. If you have been wounded, but you've never properly treated them, they never get healed. And every time someone offends you, it's because you have an open wound. It's like them putting salt over it. And you, we all know how we respond when someone pours salt on a wound. We scream. We get angry. We get upset. We hurt. Satan says, if I can get you to a place in life where you live wounded, you'll never be healed. And if you never get healed, that's only a matter of time before it actually kills you. I, 
I can't minister like I want to. I got a wound. I can't sing like I know I can. I got a wound. I can't serve the way I know I can because I've been cut. You can't put me in the front, Pastor, because I'll just bleed all over everyone. And we try to ignore it. The more we ignore it, this is what happens. We find a new place for our offense in, our, in the areas of our hearts. It may not be here anymore, but somewhere down the line in life, you're going to bump into that very thing you hid. God doesn't want a new place for your offense in your heart. He wants to heal your heart so that you are not or captive, or uh, in prison to that wound anymore. Psalms 139, 23 through 24, and here I'm going to finish. 139 of Psalms, 23 and 24. This is David speaking. God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. Examine me thoroughly. Find out everything that may be hidden within me. Put me to the test and sift through all of my anxious cares. 24, see if there is any path of pain that I am walking on and lead me back to your glorious everlasting way. That path that brings me back. To you. Come on. Bring me to that path that leads back to you. That leads me back to you. That leads me back to you. I want everyone to stand to their feet. I want you to lift up your hands. I want us to surrender. If you really are looking for a surrender, I'm talking about folks that are lifting up their hands. You're literally saying, God, I'm giving you absolute permission in the depths of my heart. Swift through. Go examine thoroughly. You know what's in my heart. There's some folks here that you might not even know what you're hiding because it's been so long. But go ahead and tell the Lord, examine my heart. Look and see if there's anything that, I, that I've hid from you. I surrender my offense. I surrender my hurt. I give you permission to tear down the wall that I've erected through my pain, through my anger. I forgive my husband. I forgive my wife. I forgive my boss. I forgive my neighbor. I forgive my parents. I forgive, I, re I release them. I choose to be free today. Come on, don't look at Pastor Joe. This is for you. This is for you. I'm believing for God to break you free and to heal your heart. As a child, this happened. God, heal my heart. I said some things I shouldn't have. Heal me. Forgive me. My, 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 my. Father, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for today's message. We thank you for the power that is healing us. 
I thank you that when we leave this place, Daddy God, every open wound is being healed even as we speak. Thank you for the wisdom that we need to move forward out of offense. Thank you that I, we can declare today by faith, with unwavering faith that is, that we are no longer offended. And if it takes a month for it to actually take over, God, we're going to take our first steps by declaring, I am free. And tomorrow, we're going to say it again. And then you, we're going to be led by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost to lead us in our prayer. And how to pray for those that we've been offended with. Thank you, because that is what your word says. You, you did not leave us as orphans, but you left us with a comforter, a teacher. Spirit of God, we give you all of the praise and all of the glory.